You are listening to Esoteric Discussions with Valentine St. Aubin on Peterborough FM, www.peterborough.fm. Welcome to Esoteric Discussions with me, your host. I am Valentine St. Aubin, and welcome to another show uh, with me tonight. It's um, the 13th of February, 2013, and I don't have a lot of time to play with tonight, so I'm just going to jump into this show and get on with it, because I've got a fully packed show. In the first half, I'm going to be giving a dedication to the... um, well, he's he's now passed away, but to Aaron Swartz, who is remembered as an internet activist. Uh, he is one of the architects who helped to stop SOPA, um, uh, the SOPA Act, which would basically take away your rights to use the internet freely. Um, he was also a child prodigy, and he wrote um, the code uh, for... Um, the RSS aggregate news feed as well. That's what he's he's remembered for. Um, and he went on to um, to create his own company called Infogami, which then merged with Reddit, which um, is also a, another spin-off of um, of uh, a news aggregate type site. So he was um, a very busy individual person, and um, he uh, he 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 died. Mysteriously, I think that's probably the best way to explain this. Um, he was found dead in his apartment on the 11th of January 2013, so just last month. Um, and all sorts of things are being said about uh, the reasons for why he was found dead. But um, the official line is that it was suicide. So I'm going to just give a basic rundown as to um, his life and what he what he was on this planet to do. Um, he was very different from Mark Zuckerberg, who was the founder of Facebook. And um, uh, Aaron was not someone who could be easily bought out with money. Um, and he had a very strong social conscience. So in just a few minutes, I'm going to begin um, my dedication to him. And many people have not heard of Aaron Swartz, so this is an opportunity to introduce you to him and to his work and his legacy, because he will be, he will be remembered in, in the future for his activism um, as we walk into these dark days, these dark years we're about to walk into. Um, and later in the show, I'm going to be joined by Sonia King, who is the director of um, Lawson Hunt Immigration Services, and she's going to be discussing her business. Um, she's, I guess you could say she's a social campaigner in her own way, and she works with the public, and um, she's going to be joining me, and we're going to be talking about the services that she offers here in Peterborough, and they're also offered worldwide. So it's a fully packed show, so I'm going to get on with it. So, as I said... Um, so tonight I'm going to be t- talking about Aaron Swartz. Now, just um, some background information about Aaron. He um, he was born on the 8th of November 1986, and he belongs to what we call the Pluto in Scorpio generation. Uh, and people who were born in within this generation were born between 1983 to 1995. They're the Buffy the Vampire Killer generation. Um, they're the vampire generation they're very much drawn to uh, these dark type themes these gothic themes and you'll see them you know they like to walk around with their sunglasses on drive in their cars with their with their uh, black tinted uh, windows as well um 
and they go between extremes. So you'll get some of uh, some individuals who um, basically will hurt themselves quite badly, and others who will excel quite um, quite high. Uh, the, the two extremes within the generation um, are, are, are mind blowing. Um, but basically, what they are here for, people who are born within this time period. Um, just in generally speaking, they're here to uh, to challenge power-based systems. That's what uh, you know. Scorpio is all about power, so they are very in tune with power structures and trying to overcome um, injustice in that way. Um, and you know, Scorpio is a very intense sign. Uh, many people who are Scorpios will tell you that uh, yes, they, 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 their waters do run very deep and they're very deep thinkers. So these aren't ignorant children. These are very clued in, wise individuals. And within this generation, we have what we call the indigos. And I don't have time to go into indigos tonight, uh, but um, you can always tell an indigo because they are very mature and beyond their years. Um, they have a confidence about them which is quite striking and Aaron suits all of the um, ticks all of the boxes for what we would call an indigo uh, not only because he was brilliant at a very young age but he was also very very tuned into wanting to help the the planet and the public at large which is special um, he had very high integrity and that's how we can tell indigos because they are here to change things up and they will put their lives on the line for us so that's what he was so um, so that's just a, a brief description as to the kind of person that we're dealing with here so he was born on the 8th of November that makes him a Scorpio um, and he was very lucky because he was born with his Venus sitting right next to his son and people who are born with Venus next to their son usually have very pretty smiles. They're, they're quite charming. And I think people did um, like him. They were drawn to him. Um, they liked to be in his presence. He had a very a appealing type of charisma. Um, and he had, if we do his numerology, and if you listen to the last show that I did, I had Richard Abbott on the show, who was a numerolo numerologist. His life path number, when you add up his birth date, is a seven which makes him um, someone born with great concentration skills, who, is, who has a great analytical mind and is a truth seeker. So I think that describes him quite well. So that's a, a basic rundown as to um, the type of person he was. So as I said previously, Aaron was a child prodigy and he co-authored the concept of RSS, which lays um, the foundation for a lot of the, the news feeds that we have um, that are around today. And he did that at the age of 14. Now, he was born into a, a well-to-do family. He, he wasn't born into poverty. Um, his father was a computer man himself. He was a computer software writer. So, um, you know, Aaron learned the... the the uh, the basic principles of computer programming and uh, took to it very well. So by the time he was 14, he was already writing his own code and he had the right foundation around him to meet the right kinds of people and be in the right types of circles. And um, from there, as he got older, he, he um, went on and created Reddit um, uh, with somebody else and he sold that company uh, to Condé Nast, who is a big media publishing company. And he made a bit of money for himself. He didn't make the kind of money that Mark Zuckerberg did with Facebook, but he, he made a small amount of money for himself. And he was also given a desk job working for Wired magazine, which um, was was within Con uh, Condé Nast, within, um, within that structure. Now, he wasn't very happy... Um, doing that and something happened and he was he was fired uh but he went on to do other things and he went on to to do some campaigning work and um he was very busy always um always championing the underdog let's say and in around i think it was around 2010 a friend of his um brought to his attention that there was a bill that congress was trying to to pass, and they hadn't done it in the way that they usually do. They did it in a very undercover and covert way. And this bill was called SOPA, 
and it was called it was known as the Stop Online Stop Online Piracy Act. Now, um, Aaron and a lot of his um, a lot of the circle around him were quite disturbed with what, with what they saw uh, with this bill because basically what it would do was it would limit um, the use of the internet and you know uh, that means changing e- changing everything that we have become accustomed to when it, when it comes to using the internet people being able to put websites up freely um, I mean besides buying hosting space but being able to express themselves freely also sharing information we share um, a great amount of information on the internet so with this with this act um, all of that would would uh, become un- would, would go under scrutiny so in a very short amount of time and we're talking about two weeks about two weeks time um, Aaron and his uh, associates managed to stop this bill and they started an online campaign and it got Congress completely frightened <laughs> uh, and it's quite amazing because um, it, it happened so quickly and he himself uh, he, he couldn't believe uh, what had happened and, and how people had had um, had flocked to him and, and to this movement um, but he definitely sparked an interest in people and everybody was, was just completely um, astonished as to what was being put forward trying to limit the, the internet now Aaron and a lot of this, the people around Aaron, he's not the only one he's the face that we know one of the faces that we know are very much into believing that the internet should remain open and free uh, for all, and they don't believe in um, this this ethos of trying to suppress information. Uh, it, you know, these are the social networking generation kids. They do everything online, um, and you know we're in very interesting times right now. And sharing online is the new way forward. It's not going to go away. Um, some of you will know about the age of Aquarius that's supposedly coming well it's it's pretty much here and Aquarius is all about bringing groups together bringing the collective together and the best way for that to happen is by the internet and by things like YouTube and you know when these types of things are being monitored or even shut down um, it's it suppresses the, the movement of information and knowledge and people are waking up right now there's 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 so many things coming up to the surface it's very hard to to hide um, the people that are on top are finding it very hard to um, to hide in the way that they have done before and this is going to grow and it's going to grow through the through the um, auspi- auspices of the internet it is, the internet will be the way that this grows so it's highly important that it remains free and that was exactly how Aaron felt and he felt that information should be free and um, and that's what he was fighting for now what happened was after SOPA um, obviously <laughs> the elite weren't happy with what happened with SOPA um, and and one, one of the things that Aaron did say is be prepared for them to keep trying to push this bill through in different ways and they have. They have tried to push this bill through in different ways. So there was SOPA, then there was PIPA, and um, then there was IPAA. And I have just heard again, now Obama's pushing for this. I just heard this released today on the 13th of February that um, they're going to try to bring CISPA back again. So eventually, eventually they're going to get this bill passed. So I am making you aware of what is coming because basically what will happen when they pass this bill, they'll have complete authority to spy on your emails, to listen in on your phone calls, to um, to monitor the internet. So that means if they don't like your website, they'll just take you down. Um, all these types of things. So even if so, if you're thinking, oh, what has that got to do with me? Well, it doesn't mean very much to you right now. But as time goes on and as they find different ways to monitor it, it can mean quite a few things. Now, I just want to wrap up um, th- my, my little discussion about Aaron Swartz and talk about what happened and what sort of has led to his death. Um, because as I say, many people haven't even heard of him or those who have heard of him hadn't heard the news that he had 
uh, that he had passed away. Um, this was not something that was broadcast on mainstream news. Um, I heard it through RT News, which is Russia Today. Uh, I don't think it was even announced on the BBC or Channel 4 or anything like that. But he was a well-known activist, so um, he is not someone that can just be brushed under the carpet. Now, around 2011, Swartz was charged with illegally downloading 4 million articles from the academic website JSTOR uh, using the network at MIT. Um, and he was accused of wanting to make these articles freely available and if he was found guilty, faced a sentence of at least 30 years and $1 million in fines. Now, the accusation is quite strange because, first of all, there's a few things that have happened. Um, three days before Aaron Swartz was found dead, JSTOR, and of course JSTOR were well aware of what was going on because they did not want to press charges against Aaron, they made, they said that anyone who was going onto the JSTOR website could have access to the um, to the articles for free as long as they registered. So they obviously weren't too upset. Now the way that JSTOR operate is, and the way that the, the academic community operates, is that academics write papers and they send them off to these journals. The journals publish them. The journals make money, but the academics do not. But it works for the academics because they want to get their work out and they want to share their research within the community. Um, so effect effectively, the publishers are taking work, which they don't pay for, but they then um, get paid, if you see what I mean. So JSTOR then have these articles and then release them to the public and the institutions and the public have to pay for them. So do you see the the issue that maybe someone like Aaron Swartz has? Why is free information being uh, charged for, you know, why are we having to pay twice, you know? Um, I think that would be the, 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 the argument. So, he, anyway, he was accused of downloading all of these articles. Now, he's done something like this before in the past. He downloaded quite a few legal documents that were available to the public, but they were being... Um, but the public had to pay for them, even though taxpayer money were helping to store them and to um, quantify them, what have you. So he'd done this before, so the authorities weren't very happy with him. <laughs> Let's put it that way. So there's a case being built against Aaron. You know, he's becoming a thorn in the side. And the thing is, they couldn't buy him out with money. They couldn't buy him out when he sold Reddit. They tried to give him a desk job, which, for whatever reason, he couldn't stick with and left. He also was given um, a research fellow position at Harvard University. And he was working in um, a department um, within Harvard focusing on ethics. And guess what he was researching? He was, re he was researching um, institutional corruption. So and when you start putting all of the pieces of the puzzle of Aaron together, he is a very intriguing individual and I will leave it in your judgment to decide if he did kill himself by hanging or if there is something else going on here. Now just as I wrap up finally because I want to just um, have some time for you to listen to an interview that he did when he was 21 years old. Um, he's got some very interesting things to say. It's only a few minutes but, uh, but I do want to, to get this in before I move on um, from to my next guest. Um, Aaron was a particular individual and uh, he had a lot to say. So while we listen to him speak, we must keep in mind that um, he was someone who could not be corrupted and someone who had something to say. And when you have these two things, they're dangerous. So... Uh, you know, there we go, Aaron Swartz, who passed away at the age of 26. And um, he hadn't even been brought to, to trial yet. His trial was supposed to start in April, and he didn't even get his trial. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, so I'm going to play this interview for you, and we're going to take a break. And then after this, I will be back with my guest, uh, Sonia King, who is the director of Lawson Hunt Immigration Services.
ever since Napster, the music industry has been trying to kill file sharing, right? You know, Napster was this huge global party of, you know, everybody suddenly had access to the largest music library in the world. And what did they do? Well, they went after Napster and they shut it down. Well, it completely backfired, you know? They shattered Napster into millions of little pieces spread across computers all around the globe. And now, if you want to shut it down, you have to track down every single one of them and turn it off. And they just can't do that, you know? They send out letters every month trying to shut down a couple here and there, but it just doesn't work. You know, there are just too many. It's, it's out of the bag now. Once it's that far distributed, it's really going to be hopeless, you know? They have various technical attacks of spoofing and, you know, legal attacks of threatening to sue people, but it's just too late. You know, file sharing isn't going to go away. The music industry, if they want to stop file sharing, there's no central computer for them to go to and shut it down. They have to go all the way to the ends of every wire. They have to snip all the cords across the globe if they want to try and stop it. You know, the network is built so that there's nobody in charge, that everybody has control over their own communications. So the fascinating thing about the internet is it's built around this thing called the end-to-end -end principle, which says that all the intelligence is at the ends of the network. You know, if I want to talk to Fred, you know, it's my computer and Fred's computer that's in charge. In between, they're just a bunch of wires. You know, at a very concrete level, I have a wire to my ISP who has a wire to a data center somewhere who has a wire to Fred's ISP who has a wire to Fred. There's no central computer in charge that you can go to and shut down and say, no file sharing. How do you have to go and find my computer and Fred's and take us out? Or you have to snip all the wires across the globe. You know, there's nobody you can go to and say, shut down the file sharing. The internet's just not built that way. So the entertainment industry thinks they can solve this problem using something called DRM, which basically means locking up all their songs using encryption. But there is this fundamental mistake they've made, which is that like, if you lock up a song before you play it, you have to unlock it. And if I'm playing it on my computer, my computer has to unlock it. And since I own my computer, I've unlocked the song. Like, it's this very obvious mistake that they just can't seem to get through their heads. You know, if my computer is unlocking the song, I can tell it to make a copy when it's done unlocking it. You know, there's just no way around that. And so, if you see, every DRM system gets broken. You know, the Apple system has gotten broken. The DRM on DVDs has gotten broken. You know, no matter what you do, it's going to get broken. And it's also kind of idiotic because, like, even if the DRM systems weren't broken, there are lots of other ways to get movies, right? It's not just downloading it from the iTunes music store. You can go out to a theater and take a copy of the print. You know, you can have a video camera. You can have a screener that they send out to people. There are just tons of ways to get this stuff. You know, putting DRM on the handful that happen to go to consumers isn't going to change anything. Instead, what a lot of people have suggested is that DRM is a way of handcuffing users, of saying, okay, we'll give you our stuff, but you can only watch it five times on four machines and only watch it when we say so. And we can deactivate it when we're done with it. You know, we have control over the way you experience our film. That makes a lot more sense. It's harder to prove, obviously, but, you know, it certainly is much more compatible with the way they've been behaving. The network is a copy machine, right? Every single time you do something on your computer, it makes a copy. First it copies it into your computer's memory, then it copies it to your computer's CPU, then it copies it out you know, to the network, and every step along the way from you to the person you're talking to, it makes another copy. The entire system works because it's digital and because copies are free. Everything works by making copies on a computer. You know, you're not going to stop that. It's the simple economics of supply and demand. You know, if you have one of something, then you can sell it to the highest bidder for the highest price. You know, whatever anybody in the world is willing to pay, you can sell it to them for that. If you have two, then you can only sell it for what the second highest bidder is willing to pay. If you have millions of them, then the only thing you're going to be able to charge for is the cost of making another copy, because otherwise someone's always going to be willing to sell it for cheaper. You know, on the internet, the cost of making one additional copy is free. You know, the so-called marginal cost is zero, so everything gets driven down to free. You're not going to be able to make money through the old models of selling individual copies anymore because there are just too many of them. You're going to have to go to other schemes. I mean, the entertainment industry is desperately trying to save their old business model, right? They're going around saying, how can we patch up and continue doing things the way we've done before? You know, that's just not going to work, right? They can continue trying these rearguard actions like DRM and like lawsuits, but eventually they're going to have to change their tune. So there are alternatives. There are sites like Rever.com, which are like YouTube, except every time an ad gets shown with your movie, you get some of the money from the ad. The problem is users just don't seem to care about it enough. You know, each individual movie only makes 30, 40 cents, right? And it's just not worth it to you to go and put it up on a smaller site like Rever when you can get the huge audience of YouTube 
and you know forget the 40 cents but these little 40 cents add up right you know with millions and millions of movies on YouTube you know suddenly we're talking about billions of dollars of revenue and so you have this weird trade-off where each little bit's not worth it enough to the users but on the whole you know companies are willing to pay a whole lot of money for it there's no technical reason users can't do this for themselves but there is an economic reason which is that you know building the software takes money and programmers and the venture capitalists are only going to pour money into the things that seem to have a high chance of return which means the centralized sites that run ads and take the money for themselves so yeah sure it's technically possible that we could develop this distributed system and in fact that's the way the internet was originally set up right people put their stuff on their own computers and when they hooked them up to the internet people visited their own machine and they controlled their own data and you know the fact is that could have worked that's just as reasonable a way of doing it as anywhere else the problem is that's just not the where the money is and when software gets funded it gets funded where the money is i mean there are two big problems one is technical and one's political the technical problem is that basically computers on people's machines at home don't have the power of servers you know they're not on all the time people buy these cable modems that don't have high enough upload bandwidth to be popular you know cable companies have people sign user agreements that say they can't run servers from home so if you want to do something like host a YouTube video it's just kind of impractical to host it off of your computer let alone your laptop you know which you pick up and take home with you so it's really hard for normal people to run servers so that's a technical problem it means at some point you're gonna have to upload your video to somebody's server somewhere else where it is run reliably and that means inevitably giving up a measure of control so that the question then becomes who do you give the control to and users just don't care enough you know whether it's YouTube or whether it's Amazon or whether it's somebody who signed an agreement with them they just don't care enough who they give it to you know the simplest thing is the best whatever gets their movie up you know that's all that matters to them I mean it sucks each time it sucks when somebody takes advantage of your stuff to make money for themselves but you know each time it's not enough for you to do something about it right each time it's okay well you know they've got my videos or that sucks or they've got my photos you know that sucks or they have my email now that sucks right but like they just don't put it together you know there's no tipping point where you say okay finally I'm fed up and I'm not gonna take it anymore I'm taking back my computer like it just doesn't happen you know it's like you know another one of life's myriad little pains that was uh, Aaron Swartz uh, giving us a bit of a rundown on the internet and business models and how it should operate and how it's not oper operating. And that was interview was done when he was only 21. That was back in 2007. Um, so uh, someone who was very, very clued in, uh, we can surely say that. Um, so my next guest tonight is Sonia King, and she is the director of Lawson Hunt Immigration Services, and we're gonna have a nice conversation. You don't need your radio or your PC to listen to Peterborough FM. Use your smartphone instead. Just use your browser and connect to www.peterborough.fm and click Listen Live. Peterborough FM, the station that listens to you. So my guest this evening is Sonia King, who is the director of uh, Lawson uh, Hunt Immigration Services. And we're going to be talking about um, immigration and uh, and what, you know, this is a service that's offered here in the Peterborough area, and um, there's many people that need this type of advice. So I'm very happy to have Sonia onto my show so we can have a, a good chat about um, the facilities available to um, the wider public here because, of course, Peterborough is a very diverse area. And we have many people from different backgrounds. So I will bring my guest onto the mic. Sonia, say hello. Hello. Um, how are you? <laughs> I'm fine. Thank you for joining me this evening. And um, I'm excited to have you on my show. I've been wanting to have you for a while. But you're a very busy woman. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, very busy working. And, you know, you, you created this company, what, about a year ago now, uh, didn't um. you? About a year and a half ago, about, yeah, it's uh, coming up to 18 months, I expect. And it's quite difficult, especially in the climate that we're in, um, people trying to become self-employed, trying to get out there and do their own thing. So you're one of the lucky ones, aren't you? Because you, you've had a bit of success, you, you, you've, you're getting the clients through the, through the door and 
um, people are learning about your work, aren't they? I wouldn't say lucky um, in so much as hard work. I think self-employment is very difficult and um, trying to um, create something is in especially difficult for anyone. Um, I, I do think, however, you must research your market before you you start self-employment and also whatever whatever you do you must have a particular expertise and knowledge about what you're doing to be able to offer the best that you can and I think what people are looking for is quality and um, and also customer service elements of things as well as um, um, in a, com a company which has a degree of integrity about it so they're looking for those sorts of things because they just people are just not going to spend their money in a recession on on something which they believe has little value to them. Absolutely. I think that's very well said. Um, before we get going with our conversation, Sonia, tonight, uh, just give um, the public your, your website address so that maybe they can jump online and, and have a look while they listen to you to you talk and, and, and listen to this interview. Okay. Um, I have uh, two pages. Uh, my first is uh, www immigration-assistance.co.uk and uh, a more informative um, site is the www.lhisltd.com Excellent, thank you very much. In terms of immigration law and um, what people uh, are eligible to know uh, in terms of their rights and with when when someone comes into let's say Peterborough and they're from abroad, what is the first thing that uh, you advise them when when they're coming towards you and the maybe let's say they want to stay here in the area uh, and they want to maybe bring a, a relative over with them as well because we tend to get quite a lot of that nowadays people moving around migrating. Um, what are the first few things that you advise to them as to how they can go about uh, being here in the UK? Um, advice is individual specific and it's based on individual circumstances so your advice will be different on every occasion and the way you approach your customer will possibly be different on every every occasion and not all customers want to stay um, on a permanent basis they might just want a few more months or, or, or just a, a short period to sort something out so um, it's very um, it, it's tailored to the individual and that is why um, immigration law um, has to be regulated um, there are several regulatory bodies the, the law society regulates solicitors and the bar council um, regulates the barristers people who were not um, legally qualified are regulated by the office of the immigration services commission and uh, other than that, you cannot give immigration law advice. Okay, so your company, for example, you you obviously are regulated and you fit all the criteria needed to, to give advice um, to the public, obviously. So what, what would you say is the demographic of the, the, the people that you're seeing? Um, whereabouts are they coming from? Uh, I suppose you have a wide clientele, but... Um, what are some of the backgrounds of the people that that you're that are coming to to get advice for, from you? Um, because uh, immigration concerns the world, you get people from just about a a any country. It, it, you could get someone you, from just about anywhere, um, and so it, it it's very wide spectrum in in terms of demographics, and you can't just pin it down to oh, I get. Um, people from just one country or a, 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 a particular region of the world um, what what happens is, is people come from anywhere and you have to be prepared to look at that person as an individual and research their their individual circumstances and possibly even country mm. so I mean you know for example you're an individual worker a uh, woman doing your own thing and um what what is different about what you're offering compared to maybe a bigger company, for example? Obviously, you have lots of competition. There's other organizations out there doing what you do. Um, so, I mean, what makes you, if you can say, 
different to maybe others that are doing what you're doing? I'm not sure what makes me different, but um, I, I do have my own unique approach. And um, one of the things um, I'm not sure whether um, anyone else in the area is doing this is that I offer consultations to clients. And I do not charge for these consultations. So they can come in and sit down and have a chat about whatever it concerns them and uh, see whether that see whether I am the person that they want to be working for me obviously if they don't want me they can go elsewhere um, I also run clinics in um, in the Cambridge area and uh, I have an, an arrangement with uh, women's aid where I could pop in once a month if they, they have anyone who needs any help and a chat just to have a chat with that person so I, I don't know whether that's unique and I think um, maybe even being a female having the ability to go and sit down with, with um, people who have been harmed by domestic violence in, in the immigration context it, it might be something unique but I'm not entirely sure um, working on my own coming back to your question um, and being a female is not easy um, but uh, it, it isn't something that it, it frightens me. I, I, um, I, and the fact that I'm just a small company also is not it, is not a deterrent to to, to my continuing what I do because I think that um, I think that what drives me is is the fact that I want to build something, and um, and I'm working very hard towards doing that, and and my gender or the size of the company, uh, neither um, are barriers. So, Sonia, tell, tell us, what type of services do, does your um, business um, offer? Um, are we dealing with visas, that type of thing? What kind of uh, clientele, would you say, comes through your door and, and the types of uh, cases and things that you find yourself working on? I work on just about anything that could show up. So I do um, variations to visas, uh, whether it be uh, uh, switching from uh, being a student to becoming a spouse or uh, a, a straightforward spouse visas, uh, student visas, points-based. Um, uh, also um, points-based work visas. Um, I also look at human rights visas, which which come up quite frequently, um, to do with lots of issues, medical cases, um, family cases, uh, cases that could border on asylum but would not meet the asylum cri criteria um, that they, uh, you know, the uh, asylum um, convention. Uh, definition of, an, of, of of refugee and also um, I look at um, giving one-off advice to people as well I am I do asylum cases but very rarely um, as they take up a, a, a lot of um, input I mean obviously this might be a conversation to have in the next show that we do because uh, we can go quite in depth with mm -hmm. with the field that you 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 work in in terms of um uh, immigration law and uh, you were just talking about human rights obviously there's a, a vast distinction between these two areas maybe just very very briefly um, as I say maybe we can have another conversation at another time to to talk more in depth in terms of the history of of immigration law but how are, how do these two differ what I mean I'll let you explain um, the difference between maybe immigration law and maybe like human rights law and um, and where these two um, separate? Well, immigration law concerns the right of a country to uh, regulate who comes in and who leaves um, their borders. Um, basically, no one has the right to live in any one country um, unless they're a national of that country. So um, immigration law is specifically... Um, 
um, structured to um, set down the rules that regulate how and in what circumstances anybody could come into a country, um, how they can be expelled from a country, and, and all the various processes in the middle. Human rights law, on the other hand, um, is, is a very vast area and it obviously will overlap with um, immigration law in terms of things like um, the right to marriage, the right to a family and private life, the right to freedom from torture, ill treatment, inhuman and degrading treatment, which comes into the asylum area. So there's always going to be that ov overlap. And the right to life, for instance, which is a qualified right, because in some jurisdictions the right to life um, is taken away after you commit uh, such a heinous crime that you will be hanged. So um, our our um, our laws do in in inter overlap and and interlock. So human rights is a is a vast area. It's a very um, complex area, and. I, I suppose you have to be quite specialist in your understanding of what's going on to um, to actually frame it correctly. Excellent. Well, definitely we, we need to have another conversation at, at another time, I suppose, and talk more about like immigration law and, as you were saying, you know, um, the other side with the human rights asylum, because um, all of these, these areas um, are interesting, of course. And as you say, you get a, a vast wide of people coming to you and they could be hitting any of these these subject areas, couldn't they? Um, and needing advice, yeah. Excellent. And also, you know, my guest Sonia tonight. She's not only a, a self-made woman and and busy doing her thing with the immigration services, but she's also a very creative soul as well, aren't you? Sometimes, it depends. <laughs> Well, you write poetry, and um, well, you, you've you've done quite a lot in your lifetime, haven't you? Yes, I do write poetry. I I I, I love words. I've always loved words, so and stringing them together. So it, it to me that's fun. I mean, some people see it as boring and bizarre, <laughs> but I find it uh, I I find it exhilarating and and uh, lifting. Um, as we just. Coming to the close to this interview, Sonia, I know you do what you would like to at least share one or two, I think, maybe poems with us this evening, wouldn't you? And I think they're related to um, some of the work you have done. Is that is that correct? Yes. Yes, they are. They are. So I'm just going to give the mic to you <laughs> and let you explain um, the background to to the first poem and then I'll, I'll allow you to just recite it. OK. Okay, this uh, first poem uh, is about torture and a lot of people who you might come across in the world have been tortured but they won't speak about it. Um, this poem is called Child of Torture. So I'll read this to you. Sticks and wires in full view. Sticks and wires connect to you, crushing the existent, nothing new. Crushing the existent, the existent you. Inverted head, head hung down, just one inch above the ground. Head so heavy, en route to drown. The ropes to your ankle, your proudly worn crown. Dribble, dripping, sap never to preen. Audible echo, a distant scream. Child of torture, in reality, no dream. Consciousness slipping in, out, out, in. Then you scream. Moans in battle, outweighed, then drowned. Noises congregate in indiscernible mound. Darkened room, off long dark hall. Upside down you feel so small. Teeth gripping hard on wooden sticks. Genitals awakened by electrified clips, freedom in death. So far, yet so near, only you can know your own despair. A body you recognize intact will remain, with altered mind hounded, haunting memories of cruelty and inflicted pain. Blood pouring, blood untapped, salted taste, this crimson sap, scarlet splatter sprays on walls. Brown spots some large, 
some small silent marks gather in your memory. Thank you. That was really nice. Um, well, not nice. It was very detailed and very, very, no, no, it was very visual, um, but it was beautifully uh, written. Um, that's, that's a very nice poem. And um, you've got another one, and this is Tortured One. That's the name of it, yes? Yes, it okay. is. Okay. What's the background to this one? Um, Tortured One is... Uh, the it's it's a sort of like a picture that you'd see um from people who have been tortured their eyes are empty and um and cuz they've been through so much and uh, this one this one um talks about um the eyes mainly um and what what you would imagine lies beyond those eyes and uh, I've called it tortured one okay so i'm going to let you recite this poem as well vacant are your eyes revealing no truths no smiles no dares vacant are your eyes staring unfocused black hooded hoarded by locusts grey matter loosened women cruel intrusions painstakingly winner winning feeble heart silently cries feeble heart wherein your pain safely lies soul empty soul bereft once a man now nothing left vacant eyes no thoughts do you make vacant body with hands that shake that's nice as well um well well written obviously it's it's uh it brings up a lot of imagery um a lot of sadness as well and I think you've captured um, the mood of, of these these things that happen very well. Um, so in terms of um, clientele, have you had many case studies, you know, cases that have incorporated this theme of torture? Yes, I have. I've had, I've had quite a few. And um, it, it, it is very difficult to get through to a torture victim. In fact, in some cases, it can be ne- nearly impossible um, because of what they've been through and, and their experiences. Um, it, it, it is a sad world we live in. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why the work that you do is, is very important. And um, obviously, you, you get quite a lot of feedback because you have that one-on-one dimension with your clients. And um, I suppose there's a sense and liberation of helping somebody, you know, making that difference. And as you say, when somebody comes to see you, you give the first consultation free, um, which in itself can be very helpful. I suppose you might get those that come back and do further consultations and I suppose you get those that may just benefit from the first conversation yes and um and and is that enough for them um um you're quite right some people um they get enough from a telephone call sometimes or or a Skype consultation where they say can I contact you on Skype or something I say yes and uh, you never see them again, whereas others, you might speak to them, and then six months later, they show up and say, I'm ready. So if someone who's listening tonight to this interview, and um, they're looking for someone just like you, just by chance, what is what are the first steps that they need to take to be able to um, make a consultation? What are the steps that you advise with your website, or um, how can they contact you? Um, by telephone. Um, Skype uh, email I can be emailed at mail on at lhisltd dot com um, or simply by um, showing up at the premises uh, and asking for an appointment and, and where are the premises because you, you advise in different locations is that correct? I do. So if they if they turn up and I'm not there, um I will I will be notified and and I will contact them later. Um the premises are based um on the second floor at Stuart House. Um and all they have to do is to to go there and speak to the receptionist. And so do you have any further plans to if you if you can find the time I suppose with what you know with what you have going on as well with with your business but do you have any further plans to write more poetry or maybe do some um 
uh, maybe stand up and do spoken word or anything like that? I'm not too interested in stand-ups and spoken word, but if I do write something and someone says to me, I want you to read it or recite it, um, depending on, on my mood, I probably would do. And I have been asked to um, do a poem for um, an organisation for their Valentine's party um, this weekend, next weekend, sorry, which is the... 16th of January which I've agreed to write well, I'm getting nowhere with it very fast <laughs> so um, we'll see how it, how that goes <laughs> that's excellent well I want to thank you um, for, for being a guest on my show this evening and for offering the service that you offer as well um, so those that are listening tonight if, if this is something that's helpful to you if you live in the Peterborough area um, you can contact Sonia through the, the different websites that she's given and, um, and also in person at uh, the venue that she, she works out of. Um, do you take international clients or do they have to be based here in mm. Peterborough or the UK? No, I have clients that contact me from overseas um, by email and I work with them as well. Okay, so you don't have to just be here based in Peterborough. You can be worldwide, and um, she's an international woman. <laughs> so, uh, so that's my guest for tonight. Thank you for listening, and um, I will at some point maybe have you back on the show, Sonia. Maybe you can do some poetry or something like that. We can talk about <laughs> we can talk about that side of you as well, because um, you have a very interesting history, don't you? I mean, you you, you have um, worked for yourself in the past. You've You've tried to maximize life, haven't you? You've tried to live the best way you can and maximize all your skills, haven't you? Um, I have, and I think I've done everything that I've ever wanted to do. Um, this, this, this is a, uh, this is just, this is something extra. Everything I, I said I would do as a child, I think I've done it. To be honest, so um, I, uh, I'm, I'm not unhappy with. Uh, my uh choices but you know we all we all have to make choices and carve out our ground well well done and i wish you much more luck for the next coming year with your business and i know it's going to continue to grow so good luck and uh make sure you find time for yourself as well because i know you are very busy <laughs> thanks for joining me <laughs> thank you very much for having me okay so that's going to do it for tonight um that was my second guest Sonia King who is the director of Lawson Hunt Immigration Services and um, I just want to thank you guys for listening to another show I hope you enjoyed uh, my dedication to um, to Aaron Swartz and I got you thinking maybe about a few things maybe not I'm not sure <laughs> but I'll be back not next week but the week after that and until next time keep your eyes on the stars